I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare in the trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm joined by Billy Ray, whose screenplay credits include Flight Plan, Hearts War. He's currently uh, writing and directing a film based on the Robert Hansen uh, scandal called Breach, and he also wrote and directed Shattered Glass. Thank you, Billy. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Is it true that you sold your first piece when you were 19 and it was an episode of The Jetsons? That is true. Uh, my father was a literary agent for about 32 years, and uh, I had heard through his agency that Hanna-Barbera was trying to create a new block of Jetsons episodes. They had filmed uh, 24 of them in the 60s, and they wanted to do another 41. So they had sort of a cattle call for writers, you know, who were starving, and, you know, <laughs> at 19 I qualified. I sold an idea, and they paid me to go to script, and uh, the agent who made the deal for me felt so bad that I was being paid so little <laughs> that he actually didn't take commission on it. Oh. That was my first sale. That's very uncommon behavior in an agent. I hope you kept it, them. <laughs> you know, I'm the son of an agent, so okay. I was expecting him mm -hmm. to behave decently, and he did. What was the impetus to write? Like, what, what was the, um, how'd, you, how'd you get to even uh, even wanting that Jetsons job? Well, my father represented some great writers, and uh, among them were Alvin Sargent and Paul Brickman and Frank Pearson and mm -hmm. Steve Shagan and, you know, Carol Sobieski. There were some Heavyweights. Big names, yeah. And uh, when I was 18, I said, Dad, I think I want to try to be a screenwriter. And he said, okay. And he took me into his office. And in the office, it was then called Adam Shane Rosenberg, they had these stacks of all the screenplays written by their clients. And he pulled out the screenplay for ordinary people. And he said, okay, do this. Was that a favorite of his? Um, I think it was a favorite of anybody right. who knows screenplays. Alvin Sargent's pretty great. And, yeah. and he was saying to me, that's where we're going to set the bar. And the bar has been set for me there ever since. Wow. And I've never stopped trying to get there, you know. You say you've been making your living as a writer since 1988. Mm -hmm. uh, your first produced credit uh, came in 1994. Mm -hmm. what, what filled up the intervening years? Well, as you know, in this business, you can be very hot and not get a movie made. Right. And when I first started, um, I started with a teeny, teeny little sale and then was able to uh, set up my first pitch. That's when I really became a professional writer, because I could I could quit my other job. Right. Um, but I went from you know job to job for those uh, those six years, and was hot and cold and hot and cold. And you know I'd been sort of flavor of the month when I first right. sold something. Did you know you you were doing good work despite what was going on or not going on uh, business wise? Well, I hoped I was doing good work, and all writers um, die if they don't have people around them who are telling them you're doing okay. Right and you're gonna get something made, it's gonna be fine. Did you have a group that read your stuff for input? Always, for always. And they were always very encouraging, but tough on me, which I think you have to have as much as you need the encouragement. It was a frustrating period because I've always felt like um, this is a business that's giving me a nice lifestyle and I wanna make a contribution. You know, I've been making a living as a writer since 1988, but it was really until about 2001 uh, that I stopped being embarrassed by my okay. career and, and really hating everything that, that was attached to that. Um, that started to turn and, and, and it became a lot easier to, to meet strangers. <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd be um, meeting someone, you know, at a party or on a golf course or wherever and they'd say, what do you do for a living? I'd say, I'm a writer. They'd say, what kind of writer? I'd say, I write movies. They'd say, what have you written? And, you know, I'd have to reel off a couple credits that right. I wasn't proud of and, uh, that was, that was rough. How did you keep your enthusiasm up during that time? Because I knew I was capable of better, and uh, I knew that I was never gonna stop working. I knew that um, I, I didn't have control over what would happen to scripts once they were written, and I didn't have control over who would be attached to them or what they would do with them, but I knew no one was gonna outwork me. Right. How many feature screenplays did you write before that first produced one? Were there a lot? Oh boy, uh, between 88 and 94, there had to be eight. Or even before you sold one, were there a lot before you sold one? Oh yeah, one? I mean, when I, when I first started writing, I was working for two TV movie producers <laughs> named Jim Green and Alan Epstein. And, In what capacity? Uh, I started out as their gopher. Okay. Uh, you know, picking up their tuxedo, you know, taking care of their dog, whatever right. they needed. And, uh, you know, reading whatever came through that office, mm -hmm. which is, of course, the greatest source of education for a writer, right. is reading usually bad scripts. You right. can learn a lot from them. Um, what do you learn from reading a bad script? 
Well, the obvious is what not to do. Right. Um, the things that I, that I see a lot when people send me scripts, and it's not just by young writers, it's sometimes by pros who've just sort of gotten lazy and begun to phone it in. There are two things that, are, that seem to be missing a lot, subtext and dilemma. Um, the screenwriter's job is to provide dilemma for, um, for their characters. You know, Holly Hunter at the end of broadcast news, does she get on that plane with William Hurt or does she not? Right. No matter what she chooses, she's gonna lose something. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic dilemma. Um, Donald Sutherland at the end of Ordinary People who realizes, oh my God, my wife hates our son. Right. So he's gonna make a pretty tough choice. He's gonna lose something no matter what he does. The job of a screenwriter is to provide characters with dilemmas so that we can find out who they actually are under pressure. How do you write something like subtext into a screenplay? Because usually it's what's not there. Right. Well, that's, that's the thing. And it takes the nerve to trust your reader enough to know that he's going to, or she, is going to know what's actually happening in a scene. Mm -hmm. um, when I read screenplays lately, what I'm finding is, probably my biggest criticism of them, is that the characters are saying exactly what they're thinking. Right. That you'll read a script and... and the writer will have thought up this fantastic backstory for the character, and the character then just barfs it all out and says things like, well, I'm really upset because my father didn't love me and, and, and didn't take care of me, and that's why I'm treating you this badly. And, wait, stop. That's <laughs> just garbage. Right. Um, what percentage of the time do you, as a person, say exactly what's on your mind? Probably never. Zero. <laughs> right, of course. You work in Hollywood, right. so it wouldn't be a good idea. Right. Um, well, people in real life very rarely reveal the totality of themselves. And even if they did, it would be bad filmmaking to try to chronicle that. Sure. So what you want is to give your actors room to act. In other words, what's in the parentheses is a lot more important than the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to young writers, if I go to AFI or UCLA or SC, and, and I will pick on one of them. And I'll say to them, okay, I want you to say to me, I'm really glad you're home. And when you say it, mean I love you. And they'll say it. I'll say, okay, now say it and mean I hate you. And they'll say it totally differently. And then I'll say, now say it and mean I'm glad you're home because you're my drug dealer and I've been jonesing. <laughs> and then they'll say it that way. Right. Same line. The dialogue never changes. It doesn't have to change. But what's in the parentheses changes and changes the way that you read that line. That's... That's giving room for an actor to act. And I think the thing that marks bad dialogue from good dialogue, as, as I understand it, is just the complete absence of subtext. Mm -hmm. You have to have it. Do you have rules for things like structure and pacing? Do you, are you conscious of those things when you're writing? Uh, I took a great class taught by Robert McKee, which is... The guy. Of, <laughs> the guy, sort of a cliche in Hollywood. Um, but I learned things in there that I use and apply on every script. And even if I'm breaking the rules, it's helpful to me to know what those rules are. Um, the McKee class taught me a way of thinking about writing and thinking about structure um, that has never left me. Right. And, and I actually think, um, well, here's something that I tell young writers all the time. You cannot teach someone how to write. You can't give someone an ear for dialogue. Right. You can't give them a feel for characters. But there are five screenplays that I think all writers need to master. And if they can master those screenplays, they can at least understand structure. And for me, those five are Broadcast News, Rocky, Ordinary People, Kramer versus Kramer, and The Wizard of Oz. Now, I'm not saying those are the five greatest screenplays of all time, although right. I could make a case for any of them. Yeah. They're pretty stunning. Um, but they all work on such different levels. Their structures are so different right. and so elegant. Um, if you can understand what makes those five tick, you can structure a screenplay. What's the most challenging part of writing a screenplay early on in the, in the process? There's no part of the process that isn't challenging. Mm -hmm. It's all really hard. Right. Um, I, I read this interview with John Updike once, who said that there are two fun days in writing. There's the day where you first get the idea, and you drive around thinking about all the possibilities. And there's the day where the published book is brought to your house. <laughs> and everything in between is, is really tough. And I don't want to over-dramatize it, but, but I think to a certain degree that's true.